Okay. Um, right. Hi. Uh, <laughs> um, my name is Michael. I am here in Hamburg in my kitchen. And what I really love about teaching is just sharing the things that I'm constantly learning. And because I haven't been actively teaching that much in the last few months, um, I thought, you know what? Hey, there's the internet. The internet is awesome. And um, I can just talk into the internet and then see if anybody listens. And um, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started. So the first thing uh, that I've been learning, or the first set of things, I should say, comes from this book, which is called Why We Sleep. And it's by a neuroscientist called Matthew Walker. And it's fantastic because I just don't think I gave sleep that much credit before. I mean, I always knew that it was a good idea, but I always kind of thought, ah, I can get away with not sleeping the sort of eight hours that people say that I should. But he makes some really good points, backed up with some incredible scientific evidence that sleep is basically the most important thing that we can do um, to make sure that we stay healthy and happy. For those people who get regularly seven to nine hours of sleep um, each night, these people tend to have uh, less cancer. They tend to have um, fewer like sugary food cravings. They end up um, getting type 2 diabetes less frequently. Uh, they end up getting Alzheimer's disease or other forms of dementia, um, either not at all, or if they do get it, then it tends to be like five to 10 years later than people who don't get enough sleep get it. Uh, tend to have fewer mental health problems like depression, anxiety, um, tend to be able to focus more, tend to get into fewer uh, automobile accidents, uh, and you know, all sorts of things. Like life is just better with the right amount of sleep. And you know, who, who knew? Um, but the thing that really impressed me, and I'm just going to go ahead and read it right out of the book because I, so what he says is, I quote, in the Northern Hemisphere, the switch to daylight savings time in March results in most people losing an hour of sleep opportunity. Should you tabulate millions of daily hospital records, as researchers have done, you discover that this seemingly trivial sleep reduction comes with a frightening spike in heart attacks the following day. Impressively, it works both ways. In the autumn within the Northern Hemisphere, when the clocks turn back and we gain an hour of sleep opportunity time, rates of heart attacks plummet the day after. A similar rise and fall relationship can be seen with the number of traffic accidents, proving that the brain, by way of attention lapses and microsleeps, is just as sensitive as the heart to very small perturbations of sleep. Most people think nothing of losing an hour of sleep for a single night, believing it to be trivial and inconsequential. It is anything but. So, <laughs> I mean, that's that one fact alone uh, has basically converted me. I'm like, I'm going to plan my life around sleep and make sure that I get enough now because, hey, why not? And it feels good. So, like, what's to stop me? Fantastic. So the next thing that I've learned, and I just saw this yesterday in this book. So this book is called From Bacteria to Bach and Back, The Evolution of Minds. Um, and it's by a guy called Daniel Dennett, and he's a philosopher. He points out that there's a type of termite in uh, Australia that can build castles that bear a striking resemblance to uh, La Sagrada Familia, the cathedral that, uh, that Gaudi planned in Barcelona. And here's the picture. But the one on the, the, one on the left is the termite colony, and the one on the right is Gaudi's cathedral. And I just think that's super impressive because, and the reason he points it out is that, you know, these termites, they don't have um, blueprints. Um, they, they don't necessarily understand what they're doing. Um, as my friends from the No Such Thing as a Fish podcast might even say, they probably don't even know they're termites, mate. <laughs> um, but they're able to complete these incredible structures. They look like something that's actually been designed by an intelligent mind. And the reason he goes into this is that a lot of people think that the human mind is something that's so complex and so, uh, and so incredible, which it is, but they think that that means that it can't have been created by a blind evolutionary process of natural selection. Um, but he argues in this book that not only is it possible, but, but the fact is that 
Mother Nature has had enough time on her hands and has, you know, no budget and essentially can throw everything she's got into research and development. And even in a random fashion, things like the human mind can actually come about. Um, and so that's the premise of this book. And he argues it in some really fascinating ways. I don't always agree with everything that it says, but, um, but he's certainly like a grandfather uh, figure in the, in the field of um, philosophy of mind. So uh, bacteria to Bach and back. And it really kind of encapsulates a lot of what he's been doing over the last several decades uh, and makes it pretty accessible and, and fun. And he's, he's just a really great writer. He, he writes really clearly. Um, so the last thing I wanted to share with you, and this isn't actually from this week, um, but I have still been obsessing about it because I read this book a couple of weeks ago. And if you've met me recently, I've probably talked your ear off about it. Enlightenment Now, Stephen Pinker, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress. And Pinker, he's a, he's a psychologist, but he's also just a, a public intellectual. He's just a really uh, engaging, intelligent person who has written this book as a way of demonstrating that the present day is the best time that humans have ever had to be alive uh, because we are less violent toward each other on the whole. We are less likely to die of horrible diseases. We are um, more equal uh, in terms of you know gender equality, racial equality, uh, equality between diff different sexual orientations, these sorts of things. And he makes this point uh, with a lot of facts and figures. And of course, he points out that there are lots of places in the world that don't have the, the, the luxury of being that advanced yet. But, but compared to the way things used to be, a much, much, much greater percentage of human beings and an, an increasingly um, large percentage of human beings uh, is able to have a wonderful life, really, when you compare it to the way things used to be. So he sums it up, really, by quoting Barack Obama toward the beginning of the book. And I'm just going to read this Barack Obama quote because it really makes the point pretty eloquently, as he tends to do. So he says, If you had to choose a moment in history to be born, and you did not know ahead of time who you would be, you didn't know whether you were going to be born into a wealthy family or a poor family, what country you'd be born in, whether you're going to be a man or a woman. If you had to choose blindly what moment you'd want to be born, you'd choose now. And I, I think it's, it's, an, it's an amazing thing to remember. And it's such an inspiring read because it's, it can be so tempting to look at the news and to think about you know, the direction things are going in certain spheres and just think, oh gosh, this is a terrible world. But objectively, objectively, this is, this is the greatest time there's ever been for humanity. There are problems, but we can look at how things have gotten better from the past until now and apply those same tools to make it continue to get better. And, um, and for that reason, it's super inspiring. I mean, Bill Gates actually read this book and said it's the most inspiring book he's ever read. It's his favorite book he's ever read. And I think it's the most important book I've ever read. So go ahead and check that out uh, if and when you get a chance. Um, and thank you very much. This is um, uh, the end of my, my video. Um, so maybe I'll do this each week. I think it might be a fun idea. Maybe see you next week. I hope so, probably. This has been fun. Thank you. Bye.